Kevin, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. Yes, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So let's find out all about you. Give us your introduction. Yeah, the the origin story. (laughs) Um, So I was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is also known as Black Wall Street. So I I knew a a little bit about money. My parents were good about like teaching me how to save, but that was it. It was just bank account and nothing else. We really didn't talk about investments or really growing your money. And a lot of that changed in 2010. I moved to New York for an internship and learned the stock market like up close and personal. It did not go well. I was, you know, smack dab in the middle of New York City, one of the only brown faces. And when I tell you like all types of those ridiculous terms and all the, they didn't sit me down and say, hey, here are the basics, go learn. They just threw me in there. And then from that point forward, I was like, I got to figure this out. And it was the day before my last day when it all clicked. And I realized that how my parents just invested like $1,000 a year, which is just like, you know, $85 a month or so. That could have had over like $300,000 in investments in like generational wealth had we learned about it. And that's what really changed everything for me. So started building bread, started writing books and really teaching the story of making investing simple and creating generational wealth. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. So I think the work that you do is so important because you and I both know as people who are both in the personal finance sphere, the conversation is still very white male oriented, Mm -hmm. right? And so there's a a lot of people in our communities who don't even think that this is something they can do, that investing is for us, that wealth is for us, right? There's a Mm -hmm. lot of limiting beliefs in our community. And I'm wondering, so you mentioned you started learning a little bit about money with your parents. What are those major lessons that you take with you now? Yeah, I think the the pay yourself first was definitely one of those lessons that I had to learn very early on. And I think another one was they they put me in a spot to grow. For me, this is, you know, early 90s, early 2000s. My parents were like, look, you're buying too many Game Boy video games back, you know, when the Game Boy Color was a thing. And they were like, look, we're not paying for this anymore. You need to go figure this out. And I'm like, well, how do I do that? You know, that's when I learned budgeting the hard way, right? So I had to figure out, get your little, you know, planner from middle school and figure out like, okay, well, if I save $5 every week in a month, I can have like $20, I can go buy a game. So those are like some of the, the top two lessons that I learned and then started to evolve the older I got about how do you plan for increasing your net worth? How do you plan for increasing your credit score and all of those things? So it's really paying yourself first and then like that that forward looking planning and projecting, if you will, on here's where I am now and here's where I want to be in the future. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned being thrown in the middle of the stock market. So what career path did you decide to take that led you there? Initially, not the stock market. (laughs) So so I actually, I did major in economics, but my very first job out of college uh, was teaching. I taught seventh grade math. And that's actually what I think contributed most to the success in my business and my career. And I didn't know this at the time. I I taught because I wanted to give back. I taught because there was a teacher in high school that really changed the trajectory of my own life. So from there, um, I I did that and then decided, okay, I've, I've seen what's going on in the classroom. I understood that we were great at sending kids to college, but they couldn't exactly pay for it. So I thought to myself, well, if I go into the financial planning space and help people to learn and invest for college, maybe I can have a better impact. And that's why I moved to New York City for the second time uh, around, became a financial advisor, did that for a number of years, and then really started to, to see my business make strides. So I've talked to other people who have also thought the way that they were going to make impact initially in the community was to become a, an investment advisor, to work for like a Goldman Sachs, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And I think you quickly start to see how systemic the barriers to access are mm-hmm. once you're behind those walls. Did you find that as well? Yeah, I, I definitely found it. And the further up I got into that space, the more it became apparent and the more I realized like, mm, this is not exactly the flavor of what I was looking for. For example, when I started, I could work with anyone. The company I was with was like, hey, look, you go, you find, use your network, find as many people as you can, show them the, the way of finance, right? And then as you started to move up, it was, look, the only people that can walk in this door have to have 250000 in cash. They don't have it. They don't make it to your office. And at that point, it was like, well, I can't talk to my parents. And I feel like the the information and the advice that I was giving 
was good for everybody to have. And if I'm only helping to improve people with a quarter million and up, how was everybody else supposed to get there to begin with? And I felt that that wasn't fair. And that's when I really started to take my own path. I left corporate and was like, this is not this is not what I came into it for at all. It was to help kids who look like me, who came from my background, to learn to build up from the bottom up, as opposed to only giving the best advice to people who who were already successful. They were all right. They were going to be fine, right? And I didn't feel like I was really adding to the world or adding to my own personal values and mission by doing that. I'm curious if your parents were concerned about you taking this pivot in your plan. Because I know like being a Latina, our parents are programmed like you got to go to college and you get a job. Hopefully you get a pension. Corporate career is like the way to go. That's the path to the American dream. Did your parents give you any pushback? Like, Kevin, are you sure you want to do this? At times, what helped me to a degree is is I, I enjoyed the distance. I would experiment. I would do stuff. I'm like, hey, y'all can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, I wanted the first in my immediate family to go away for college. First one to get a four-year degree, first one to go to grad school. And it was always a minimum of like a thousand miles away from home. So when I went to Hampton, which is in Virginia, I was 1,300 miles away. And I had to learn on my own what to do, what not to do, what career paths. I had to figure all that stuff out on my own. And a lot of times, maybe to my credit, maybe not, I would just jump into stuff, try it, and then tell my parents later, like, hey, I'm moving to New York. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the bag's already packed. We're we're going. We're doing this. Right. Um, so I'm sure they were concerned, but usually by the time that move was made, it was already too late. <laughs> <laughs> I love that advice, y'all. You heard it here. Get the hell away from your parents. <laughs> like you got to find saying. out. You got to find out what you made <laughs> of. And that was that was just my way of doing it. I totally agree with you. I did the same thing. I left them back in Jersey. I'm here in Florida. I could be a lot more reckless, knowing that my mom's not like you know she can't just drive up to my house and be like no. <laughs> You're not doing that. <laughs> yeah. This is where next time. I'll tell later. <laughs> All right. So talk me through transitioning from your corporate career to, you know, starting this business. Because I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast are aspiring entrepreneurs and they would love to turn their passion into their purpose. Talk us through how you were able to do that. I started really young. I started in 2010. I was still a rising sophomore going into my junior year of college. That's when I started. There are a lot of lessons because it's been 11 years now that have both helped me and hurt me at the same time. So starting where you're young, I mean, you're emotional and passionate and you don't know a whole bunch about a whole bunch and you don't really know that until years later. Um, So consistency and being persistent is a part of that for me. Um, The other part is being flexible. So when I started, I, I tried to blog. I just thought that was that's what it was. What I didn't understand was the audience that I was talking to were also broke college students. So talking about investing and saving to a group, including myself, that didn't have that much money and had to scrape money together to go to Taco Bell, which that was the place back then, wasn't really helpful. However, because I built out that platform in advance, when we did start to get that, that first job, when people did start to move up in their careers, I already had that presence and people started to flock to me at that point. Um, so consistency is definitely a part of it. Um, being flexible and moving with the the market um, in terms of like, where are people now? What are people looking for? And how can you plug in and help them was another big part of it. And I would say, lastly, um, understanding your value and what you can charge to whomever you are, you are speaking to. Those would, would be like my top three keys. I love that advice. Okay. So we want to talk about generational wealth. There's a lot of first generation wealth builders that listen to this podcast that feel overwhelmed with the responsibility of what it is to create wealth. So can you first off, give us a a definition. What is the difference between like getting rich and wealth? The way I like to to say it, I think Chris Rock is is most famous for saying this, but, but wealth makes other people rich. And I think that's that's the big part. When I can take care of myself and I become, quote unquote, wealthy, that's going to make my kids wealthy. That's going to make my kids rich and set up opportunities for other people. If it's just, you know, rich, it's like I got it. I get to do what I get to do. But I really don't have reins to like give opportunities and help other people also create that. So I think that's for me, that's the definition between the two. Wealth is when you are able to set up other people to create their own, whereas rich is, you know, I'm I'm having fun on my own. I'm not necessarily in a place to help other people. Mm, I love that distinction. And it makes it so much more like, 
you you realize the power that you have to mm-hmm. start, you know, changing the future, if you will, when you yeah. really understand the power of wealth. So how do we get started? What does a person who has not invested a single dollar, you know, done anything that would look like wealth creation? Like, how do we start? Yeah, I, I think the first part is relax and, and settle yourself. Because when you think about generational wealth, you're like, that's a lot of weight. Like you're talking about your kids, your kids' kids, right? Like that's, so I, I think the first part is just calm down and realize that it does start with the process and not necessarily a number. And I think mm. that's the most important thing because I, I see a lot of people say, well, I got to get to a million. I saw somebody post about their net worth and it was like 2 million or 500,000 or whatever that thing may be. All of that stuff got there from a process. And that's the most important thing. So that process is going to be investing a little bit at a time. So if it's $10 a week, right? Like not not a lot, but it's because you're doing it weekly when you can afford to get 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, you still have those processes and that habit built in. So first, center yourself and focus on the process. The next part is to be consistent and focus on the long term. I think especially with you know our community, we can feel like, well, we're already behind, so I got to swing for the fences. I got to hit the next big thing and just be absolutely perfect. And that's not necessarily the case. Slow wealth is wealth. A lot of people <laughs> think, you know, like, I don't want to wait 30 years to, to, to watch this happen. I don't want to wait 20 years or 15 years for this to happen. But the truth is, whether you do it or not, the time is going to pass anyway. So I would rather my money grow consistently and reliably over 10 years or however long it's going to take and have it as opposed to risking everything and then looking back 10 years and, and wishing that I didn't take that risky move or that it did it would work in a different way. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a mindset shift that has mm-hmm. to happen before you actually start strategically doing things. So once you've gotten to the place that you're like, okay, I'm ready to start, now you have this array of options, right? You have workplace retirement accounts, you have individual retirement accounts, you have taxable brokerage accounts, you have so many options. Like folks are like, I don't know, it's too much. It's too many decisions. You know, there's somebody over here saying 401k is a scam. You don't need that. So it's like, how do we filter through the bullshit, honestly, and make decisions that are going to not guarantee our success, but increase those chances? That's so true. It's a lot of BS out there. (laughs) I can only imagine like Instagram and and Twitter weren't as big when I was starting out. And thankfully that wasn't the case because it it is hard nowadays than what it used to be. Um, But honestly, start start from the the biggest buckets. What are the the highest leverage things that you can do, the highest chance of success, and then work your way backwards. So we know for a fact, I don't have to guess, that close to 60, actually more than 60% of millionaires, I've seen this in person, we also have data to support this, more than 60% of millionaires have their money in 401ks and individual retirement accounts. That tells me that if I want the greatest chance of success, I should start with my 401k if it's available to me and start with my individual retirement accounts. That's your base. All the other stuff that people are talking about and all the other fancy stuff, that's all extra. Start with what we know works. So for me, that means for most people, index funds make sense. And for most people, adding money, which we call dollar cost averaging on a regular basis. So every two weeks on your paycheck, first and 15, whatever that is going to be for you, that 12 to 15%, putting that into those accounts and investing it, that's going to be your highest leverage, best chance of success. If you want to do anything extra, you are more than welcome to do that. But again, we know that 60% of millionaires have their money there. And that's why I think most people should be, if again, you're looking for the highest chance of building wealth and the highest chance of building lasting generational wealth. Would you agree that it's still worth investing in a 401k, even if there isn't an employer match? And if so, why? Yeah. So one of the reasons why it is important to go there still is because it's still your biggest tax benefit right now. So I know the limits are moving up, but as of currently today, that's $19,500 that I can put in on my own and not pay taxes on. I don't get that anywhere else, period. Now, it'd be great if I can get some free money in a match, but your your IRAs right now, and again, these limits do change every now and then, is only $6,000. Do I want a, a tax benefit on close to $20,000 or do I want a, a tax benefit on just $6,000? For me, that 
that's an answer in and of itself. Um, so yes, it still makes sense because it's still going to grow, right? Um, but if I can grow and get that tax benefit with the 401k, that's usually your biggest bucket that you want to shoot for. And as far as prioritizing these accounts, right? Because obviously a lot of us aspire to be able to max out all the accounts, mm -hmm. set aside a ton of money, but we may not necessarily have the capital to do that. So would you target a 401k first or an IRA first, or does it depend? Sometimes it depends, but usually I focus on the 401k first because if, you know, if I got my paycheck and my 401k is tied to the job, it's just super easy where you really just push a button and it's set it and forget it. So that's my number one bucket. The next one right under that is an IRA. And that's because I have a little bit more control if I have any additional funds or if I have like a side hustle, and I'm making some money somewhere else, I could put that into the IRA as well. But again, it's because that's the biggest, most powerful bucket, start with the 401k, then the IRA, and then everything else kind of falls in after that. Okay. I think a lot of people also get confused because they don't necessarily know what they're investing in, in a 401k, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know what the hell a target fund is, a balanced fund, a growth value. It's so much jargon. Yeah, yeah. And so people might be like, I'm not even equipped to make a decision about where this money should go. So how do we start to decipher that? Yeah, so there are a few resources. This podcast is one of them <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, I, I do explain a lot of these concepts on, on my YouTube channel and other places. However, your HR benefits department does have resources to help you to decipher that. So if, if you, you know, you're at work and you're like, they're hitting me with all this stuff, I need to make a decision today feel free to pick up the phone or send an email and they will usually send you an explainer that is usually quite good at helping you to understand what that is. However, in either case, your 401k is just a container. That's where the money goes. You get to choose what how that money is invested. The, the options that you have are usually mutual funds. Mutual funds are what I call, I would say, a, a basket of stocks that you get to pick at one time. So instead of you going and grocery shopping and picking one ingredient at a time, you get the entire recipe, you get the entire basket already picked out for you. And when you're investing for the long term, that is usually one of your best bets in terms of solid growth, but also safety. Love it. Okay. So I'm investing for myself. Mm -hmm. You said 12 to 15%. So I mm -hmm. feel like, all right, I'm comfortable. Maybe I'm going to be able to retire. Now I'm thinking about other generations. First mm -hmm. off, let's talk about the children. What can we do to start setting them up for generational wealth? Yeah, great question. So number one, that still starts with you. And the better that you can take care of yourself and the more wealth that you can accumulate, the easier it is to transfer those assets to your children. So that's number one. Um, it also includes updating your beneficiaries on a regular basis as your family grows. There's something else that I've seen the unfortunate side of. Um, so I, we just had a child about a year ago. I had to add her to everything else on the account. So should something happen to me, it is transferred to my wife, then from my wife to the kids. So that's number one. Uh, number two, you have two primary options if you want to start investing and building wealth for your kids. The first one that most people go to is what's called the 529 plan. That is primarily to invest on behalf of college expenses. That's number one. Um, this can obviously help reduce student loan debt and help them to go to college um, with on a little, you know, a little bit cheaper. So that's number one. Um, the second one is called a custodial account. This allows you to invest on behalf of your children up to about 18 or 21, depending on the state that you're in. Um, those are two of the most important vehicles, but then obviously the third one is education and teaching your kids how to understand money, having those conversations so that when they come in control of these assets, they understand what to do, how to manage, and continue the good habits that you've built. Yeah, you know, I was talking to my financial planner because I don't have children, but I wanted to set my niece up with something that I mm -hmm. didn't have, which was some money for college. So I was actually able, as her aunt, to open a 529 account. So for anybody who's listening, who's not necessarily a parent, but there is a child that you love in your life, you can also work to set them up for success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're the cool aunt. Which is, which <laughs> yes, is awesome. rich auntie <laughs> status. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the cool thing about those 529s is that whether if you've got grandparents that want to contribute or you want to have like a, like a birthday party and say, hey, look, go ahead and, and slide us a deposit for the 529, that all counts. Anyone that you care about can actually contribute to a 529 plan, which is awesome. I love that. 
Okay, so I think one of my concerns, and this is probably just me, you know, being a, a control freak, is this idea of if I have a custodial account for a child, and I think back to what I was like as an 18-year-old, coming into a ton of cash, yo, know, I'd be a I would be a terror. So how do we prevent that from going south? Are there things that we can do? You know, obviously besides we want to educate the kids and help mm-hmm. them understand the importance of the money, but you don't have any guarantees about like, you know, what your kid's personality is going to end up like when they're a run- rambunctious teenager. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that is a risk. That is a risk. <laughs> Parents have, have actually brought this up before. Um, <laughs> so number one, I think it's, it's always important to include them as early as you can. And if you don't have those habits, if it feels like, oh my God, I suddenly have $20,000. That's you know, you, you might go crazy, right? However, if you are part of that journey and you are seeing like, I started out with 100 and now it's 200 and you start to really see it build and your kid is invested in that process, they too are like, well, I saw this when it was really small. I really want to hold on to this. I don't want to just blow it all in one night because I know it took me 10 years, right, to get here. Um, so that's one part of the process. Another way, some people see this controversial or not, but another way to do it is you can actually have a joint account with you and your child. And that way you do have more control and you can actually see all the transactions of what's going on. That's another way to do it. Um, there are no tax benefits in either case for custodial, not any huge tax benefits for custodial versus joint, except that the financial aid process. That's one that you would have to contend with. You want to talk to an accountant there. But if you are afraid of that, which is a a risk, you know your kids and you know your nieces and your nephews, um, a joint account is an option that you might want to consider with a professional. Oh, that's good to know. Okay, that makes me feel better. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so let's talk about the previous generation, right? Our parents, maybe grandparents, because a lot of folks in our communities are supporting multiple generations. Mm -hmm. And we're not really sure how to do that. Um, what are you, some of your best tips for how we can also be able to be in a place where we can provide that financial support to aging parents? This is one that's not easy. And I think to smooth that conversation over sometimes is to have that communication up front as early as you can. So for example, for my own parents, when I started to learn about the market and I was you know coming into the financial planning space, I learned a whole lot of stuff. I'm like, oh, wait, do my parents have life insurance? Are my parents saving? Do they have insurance if they get sick? How much How much are they paying for this house? Like these are all the questions just kind of like flooded my brain at once. And these were conversations that we had to have. We had to understand what assets were out there, what things were they dealing with and how to, to manage those. Um, so again, having that conversation first and starting to kind of figure out what plans can you make should an event occur or if they already have. Um, another way to do it is if you can, you may be able to, to save in advance if you have additional income or find out what is their best preference. So there are times I sat down with my dad and said, look, you know, if something happens, who would you prefer to take care of you? Would you prefer to be you know, moved in with us? If that's the case, I now need to need to plan for that in the worst case scenario. Right. Um, but again, a lot of that comes with communication and understanding what are you capable of? What support may you have? And then sometimes it has to be creativity and figuring out, you know, who's giving the care, who is paying for certain expenses and knowing what assets are out there to help alleviate some of those if those assets exist. Yeah, I think those are really hard conversations to have. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have any tips for how to bring that up in a way that will not be hella awkward, right? Because I could think about like my own conversation with my parents when I was talking about like estate planning and do you have a will? And my dad's like, I don't want to think about dying. Like this is morbid. And I'm like, but dad, it's still going to happen. So like, would you rather me not know what to do? Or would you rather let's have this conversation, let's have the awkwardness, and then we can move on with our lives. Yeah, I, to be honest, every parent is different and they're going to react in in different ways. Um, and it, it is awkward. So funny story. Well, I think it's funny. Um, so my grandmother, who, who is still with us, uh, many years ago, just called me out the blue. Uh, I was at her house and she said, hey, Kevin, I want you to come and pick out my casket. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I'm like, mama, I'm not going to pick out a casket with you. That is the creepiest thing ever. 
However, it did get me thinking about like, you know, she is not going to be here forever. And at least that gives me comfort that at least I helped some of that process and that she had some control in that. And again, at first I'm like, that's a hell no for me. <laughs> and we actually did, we like her and her children, because I'm the grandchild, right? Um, her and her kids, which my mom and them, um, they went and did that whole process. However, that made it easier for me to have a conversation with my parents. I had to say, hey, look, how would you like these things to to occur? Like, I saw this this example happen with my friends. I saw this example happen with, with such and such. Uh, and have these conversations in pieces. I think that's the most important thing. You don't want to go through the entire situation of all the bad things that can happen at once. I just start with the smallest thing. Hey, do y'all have life insurance? Because I was thinking about it. And then ha- have that small conversation. I was thinking about what's going to happen with this. And then have that little piece of conversation. Or what I think is also I've seen be helpful too, is when you have like a either a planning sheet or an asset sheet where you're writing down where all the things are. And you say, hey, look, here's my emergency plan. If something happens to me or my family or however, here, here you go. Here's all the information that you need. Why don't you fill this out so that I have your information too? And if there are mm-hmm. any blanks, if there are any blank sheets or any blank areas, you say, hey, look, I, I saw you didn't have any life insurance. Let's talk about that. I know she didn't have any plans for like burial or anything like that. What would you prefer? And that can be one way to kind of ease that conversation. Yeah, I think uh, take advantage of the holiday season too, y'all. If y'all are already going to be around a dinner table with a couple of drinks, it might be the perfect time to have these conversations. (laughs) It it, 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 it might be. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So let's talk about the transfer process of wealth, right? Because we're creating wealth. We're anticipating it's going to last generationally. Um, You did mention beneficiaries earlier. Is there anything that we should know as far as like, let's say you're a single parent, can you put your minor children as beneficiaries or is there some other process we need to think about for that? Yeah. So you can put your minor beneficiaries as your, your minor beneficiaries. Well, I guess that, yeah, you can put minors as a beneficiary. I think I worded it wrong the first time. You can do that. However, it may not be the most efficient thing um, if they're under, uh, if they're a minor, which would be like 18 or under. Um, however, it is still important to consider that entire process. Talk with an estate planner for the, the fine, uh, finite details about who would be guardian, how the ass- assets will be transferred, and all of that. Um, I will say that the most important thing, and I'll, I'll tell you a story as to why, is to make sure that it's updated. So I had two very, very awkward situations that happened to me where the older gentleman passed, and the first time it happened, these are two separate people, first time it happened, all the assets went to the ex-wife. He had not updated his beneficiaries since like 1995. And based on the state rules at that time, the beneficiary sheet is law. The I couldn't change it as the advisor and state law can change it. it. That money went to went to the ex-wife and that's out of my hands. And that was a real awkward conversation. The, the gentleman just passed. It was, I think, three or $400,000 and it was all going to the ex-wife. He didn't update it. That, wow. Yeah. Uh, second time it happened where the gentleman passed and he had four kids, but there was a gap between child three and four and four was not added on any, the fourth child rather was not added on anything. So the siblings had to get together and figure out what they wanted to do. I let them take that out, out of the office. They had, they had nothing to do with me, <laughs> but I could not change it. Like, well, can you just write them in? I was like, no, I, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, but that's something that you, you have to update. So for example, my mom was on all my stuff. Then I got married, had to change it. Had one kid, had to change it. Had two kids, had to change it. Um, So I do use a holiday time to go back and review all of my stuff to ensure that it's in line with what I want at that point in time. Mm, Wow, that is a shocking story, but doesn't surprise me because I think, you know, a lot of us tend to think it's a one and done situation where, Mm -hmm. you know, building wealth is a process, y'all. It's a journey. And um, we constantly have to learn and evolve and grow and change and, you know. That's just what it is. Yeah. All right. So I think one thing that holds, especially, I want to say women back is this idea of like money still being a very male thing, that it's up to their husbands or their partners or the men in their lives to manage their money. Can you give us some encouragement about why it's important for women to build wealth independently? Uh, a lot of reasons. <laughs> um, so one, notice that the, the story I mentioned, the men died first, which means that <laughs> I'm saying these are facts, but, but it's, a, it's important for, for a few reasons. So number one, statistically, women live longer, which means that 
whatever the guy did or what have you, you have to be able to to understand what was going on and your because your money is going to last longer. That takes more planning, more effort, and more understanding. So that's number one. Number two, a study just came out that said women are better investors than men. So you might you might be really good at it. <laughs> So that's another part. And those contributions can help grow the wealth for everybody. The communication part is, is always important. So my, my wife is uh, a little more shy when it comes to finances, but I always make sure that she understands what's going where, how to access everything and how to do anything in case something happens to me. And that is a better um measure of financial communication, which is important. And another part of generational wealth, because what you don't want to do is be a power couple or what have you. And then the one who isn't as equally yoked in terms of financial information falls off and then they squander it just because they didn't know what, what to do. You don't want that to happen. That part of that is having that conversation. A part of that is slowly growing as well. You don't have to make someone a financial expert overnight, which I think is what a lot of some people is like, oh, I can't do that. As if that person would, you know, became who they are and where they are overnight, which is not the case. Um, so take your time is extremely important. I think everyone in the situation is vitally important to the protection and the growth of financial stability and generational wealth as well. Yeah, I think you called me out because I tend to come at my husband and be like spitting all these like financial <laughs> facts at him. And he's like, I'm not ready for this conversation. You're like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I was talking to him about Bitcoin the other day. He's like, no, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> so my wife was like that. And we, we've been together. Uh, it'll be six years in November. And at first she was like, I don't want no parts of the stock market stuff. It, it's wild. And then we, we've gotten to a point where like I sent her shares of Tesla for, uh, for her birthday. And she's like, oh, like this can grow and I can use this. Man, I'm like, it's working. It's yes. working. <laughs> I love that. That it is a process, y'all. Yeah, and yeah. It's so much easier when you give each other space to grow at the pace that is, you know, natural to both. Absolutely. Of you. All right. So for everybody who's listening, that is just like, all right, Kevin, I'm inspired. I want to get started, but I only have like twenty dollars that I can invest on a monthly basis. Where do I get started? Yeah. So there are a few options in terms of like places you can get started. The first thing I'll say though, is you want to focus on fractional shares. Fractional shares allow you to afford whatever investment you want at the budget that you have. And this is an amazing opportunity because it wasn't available like even like 10 years ago, which is good. Uh, for example, I always bring up Amazon because I know Amazon is expensive. It's like $3,000 a share. I couldn't afford that when I was starting, but now if I have $20, I can invest in whatever company I choose at the budget that I have. So that is one of the first places or one of the best things that you can do, even at a small dollar amount. I'm a little biased. I know you're, you're on public as well. That's usually where I go to because it's a good learning platform where you can see other people like ourselves talk about the market. You can see what other people are investing in, and then you can do it at whatever level you want to do it at. Um, so that's usually where I go to. Fidelity is another great place um, as well. Um, so those are like two of my go-tos when I'm trying to learn about the market. But if you're brand new, those are usually places that I, I tend to steer people. Yeah, those are both great platforms. And there really is such, I think it's almost non-existent at this point. The barrier to accessing investing now is totally education-wise. It's mm -hmm. not that the platforms don't exist because yeah. they're out there waiting for you to open an account, but it is you educating yourself to the point where you feel comfortable enough to open the account, buy your first investment, automate that process, mm -hmm. start investing more. Uh, it, it really does take you kind of getting out of your comfort zone, right? That's the hardest part. Yeah. And I would say when it, when it comes to comfort zone, there are a few things that, that help me to relax because I was, I was in this space too. Uh, where I'm like, uh, I invested my first $300. I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm watching it every day. Like <laughs> what's supposed to happen with this? Um, so a few things that they helped me. Um, number one is that over time, the stock market tends to grow. So for example, 89% of the time, if you are holding an investment for five years or more, 89% of the time it's, it's positive. So that's, that's already like, okay, if I'm focusing on the long term, I'm going to be okay. If I'm focusing on the day or I invested two hours ago, I wouldn't be worried about that. I think that's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that on average, and this is from like since the 1950s, I think on average, Every 21 days, the stock market hits a new all-time high, which means that 
let's just say it was a bad day. The market was down. You don't have to panic. And it doesn't mean it's going to be three three weeks to the day, right? But it, when you are relaxed and you calm down, the market tends to move up, which is a benefit to us. And then lastly, remember that it is not an overnight game. Okay, it's not something that's just gonna you know blow up overnight and then you're you're suddenly rich. That is not the case. The way to build wealth is a really long and consistent process, which is good because it gives you more opportunities to continue to build wealth. Yeah, y'all. Uh, apparently, the only way that you become an overnight billionaire is if you buy like some random cryptocurrency that somebody's talking about on Reddit. Right, and, and get ridiculously lucky. Yeah, 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 and get ridiculously like wealthy. Like, would not recommend it. <laughs> we do not recommend zero stars. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a process. And I'm so glad for the work that you do because it really does normalize this idea that like regular ass people can create generational wealth. Okay. You don't got to come from money. You don't got to become a celebrity. You don't have to play the lottery. Slow, steady, consistent action is how this happens. Absolutely. So I'm curious do you have like a money mantra? Ah, uh, a money mantra? What I like to tell myself, rather, is that, you know, my money need a nine to five. Yes. <laughs> That's the end of the day. <laughs> like, I, I I can go on vacation. I can relax. I can go to sleep. But that money better be working. So <laughs> if we can fit that on a t-shirt, I, I'll go with that as a mantra. I need that t-shirt. That is <laughs> that is a good one. I'm I'm so here for it. And I know that folks that are listening to this podcast episode are going to want to find out so much more about you, Kevin. So tell us how folks can work with you, where we can find you on these internet streets, because uh, I, I love everything that you're doing. Yeah, I appreciate it. You can find me on all things at Building Bread. For whatever reason, I started a TikTok, so I'm there. <laughs> but I'm on, <laughs> I'm primarily on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. I answer any and all investing questions, which is what I really pride myself on. So if you hop on there and you are in the comments like, hey, what is this? Like, don't be surprised if I mention you in a video like a two or three days later. Um, so I love answering <laughs> questions, really demystifying the stock market, super accessible. And you can find me again on all things social media at Building Bread. And real quick, you are also an author. So tell us about your book. Yeah, my latest book, From Burning to Blueprint, Rebuilding Black Wall Street After a Century of Silence, is based in part in the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which is my hometown. And we talk about how do we create generational wealth, what happened in Tulsa, and what are the actual systemic barriers that are preventing uh, wealth, generational wealth building in all communities of color. And I also paint out the historical picture of what's being, what is actually happening. Because a lot of people will say, well, you know, it's because, you know, it, you see those Instagram accounts, it's the Gucci belt that's holding you back from building wealth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> so yeah. I point out those inconsistencies, why that's inaccurate, but give you a very solid plan on how to build wealth for yourself, how to build wealth for the next generation in a way that makes sense, as opposed to being overly complicated with all the charts and graphs and all that jargon. That is amazing. Y'all definitely go and pick up Kevin's book and follow him on social. You are not going to regret it. I'm always learning from all the gems you're dropping on Twitter and everywhere else. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely.